Welcome to The Real Money Show, the number one eight seven seven eight silver My name is Jeremy Wiseman. I'm joined by Jerry Karaya. And we're going to be talking about gold and silver. There is way too much to talk about this week. Uh, first being, just know that gold has hit an all-time high. We closed November above $2,000 an ounce. That's right. That's right. That's our little uh, celebration. Um, amazing. Amazing. We. It's always you know tenuous to see if gold's gonna gonna hold and it obviously did and now it's broken out even higher speaking of which jerry uh i i was sending this out to my clients um this week a few a few clients i was sending this out to that um uh chris marcus over at arcadia economics broke some news this week that jp morgan Number one, expects interest rates to fall, although that seems to be an overwhelming majority are starting to feel that way. And as a result, they see silver breaking $30 next year and gold breaking $2,300. What I thought was interesting about the report he was mentioning is that they don't say what happens when when silver breaks $30 an ounce. (laughs) So I was wondering if maybe you could tell our audience what happens when silver breaks $30 an ounce as we trade at, I think, twenty five thirty today. So as we always say, well, silver is a coiled spring. So we had an amazing month of November, just to summarize. Uh, silver gave us about 14% on the month, gold up about 6% on the month, a little bit higher now. And... The consensus is that the Federal Reserve is trapped, that they're at stage two after a long uh, winded rate hike cycle, a year and a half worth of rate hikes. They have paused. um, And now the consensus from BMO to Bank of America that rate cuts are coming. Some are citing, uh, you know, about a couple quarters from now. Some are citing could be March. But really, they have to say that. They have to say that they're going to, like what the Federal Reserve said today. Powell, this is Friday, December the 1st, and Powell came out and said that we will hike rates if we have to. That's his job. They're going to say that. But back to silver. Gold is up at an all-time high. If we're going to close out here today, we're eyeing 2100. Gold has now closed November above the $2,000 resistance. So psychologically, this is a huge technical trigger for potential massive run. And what that means is history does rhyme in the gold market. If the breakout, which launched back in 2009, gold was about 23% higher. If the same pattern that we observe today, gold could hit 2450, according to Mike Maloney's gold silver. And where that would put silver, silver will break through 30. That will go through all-time highs for silver, above $50, and leaps and bounds because you can't get the stuff now. The, the, the silver market is a coiled spring. It's the silver squeeze 2.0. The silver squeeze for peace is what we're talking about here. And you have to get yourself. The opportunity is knocking. And we don't want the door to close. The opportunity is here. The premiums, Jeremy, are still very low. And the opportunity abounds for the silver investors. Congrats for those who got in. The number, one eight seven seven eight silver The website, guildhallwealth.com. Glad you were talking about silver breaking 50 in that respect because many analysts in this market believe that once silver breaks $30, that there is no resistance to as high as $50 as the next leg up. So when when JP Morgan is talking about silver breaking 30, but not talking about where its potential lies, I think that's the reason why. I think that this is why silver's $30 price point has been the line in the sand. It's the hill we have to take. It's uh, trench warfare, and it will and it will break. And I also think that as far as the psychology, something you mentioned, that it's integral to keep silver below that $27 range, that $28 range, because the longer it stays in the lower areas of $20, the more it's a foregone conclusion once it goes over $25, $26, right? In other words, if it was meandering at 28 psychologically, okay, we've got to get up to $29.50 to get to a new psychological level, where now I believe that psychological level is, is further down. To your point, though, it's interesting isn't it? Premiums have come down. They're probably at four-year lows at this point. And 
we're back to only the really savvy are getting into the market because I guess the stock markets are rising like crazy. <laughs> and that that's what we're seeing right now. And Cobasi's letter reported to this morning in the current situation, the stock markets are up like we are in a bull market. The gold market is up like we're in a recession. Oil prices are up like a recession got canceled. And the bonds are up like inflation is black, back below 2%. And home prices are up like inflation is still at 10%. Everything is up. Uh, for the wrong reasons and things just don't make sense and I was actually on the phone with a client earlier this week just doing a, a review of the of the market and in his portfolio and and what he anticipates he's in the mortgage market and um, so we're just doing a review of, of things and he had the same question you know why is the stock market moving up like it's a bull market and and why why is gold up like as if we we're in a recession so because the consensus is that they're going to cut, they're going to loosen and this monetary tightening, that stimulus is going to come back. We were talking last week about liquidity and how there was a boom and bust cycle in liquidity. So over the last you know, couple of years, they started to tighten up the liquidity. They're draining the liquidity from the market. And then they provided, uh, I think it was uh, an investment firm provided with the heat map, and we were at the tail end of the tightening cycle. So we're anticipating liquidity. We're anticipating that. So the market, the stock market, senses liquidity coming in, but it's moving up. But this week, I had to remind people of the dangerous situation. And this was, uh, this was something that was, um, was reviewed and, and was commented about Ainsley Bullion in Australia, where they talked about a stock market melt-up, where for the wrong reasons, the stock market was moving up. The anticipation of lowering interest rates and and pumping more stimulus into the market. Remember, this, the reason why we're in this problem, this, this position, is because of the massive amounts of stimulus and the repo market in 2019 uh, of money just being pumped in. So just, just to kind of grasp what we're talking about here, everything seems upside down. Given the economic situation, which, by the way, you were talking about central banks, uh, whether they're you know, quantitative easing, and then now they're tightening. But at the same time, you have a uh, uh, government in Canada ideologically running amok and raising taxes and making it difficult for Canadians. So they're getting a pincer move against them. But as far as the indicators, they're all completely distorted. And now, as Canadians, we can feel that. We can say, what do you mean inflation's under control? You know, people's mortgage <laughs> mortgage uh, payments are, are triple, and they go to the grocery store, and, and numbers are up quadruple, and they're, they're not going out for dinners, or they're having to cut back, and they're saying, you know, I saw something on a TO blog or something like that. They said most Torontonians feel that they need to make over half a million dollars to feel financially secure. So... At the, so we've got all, but meanwhile, the Federal Reserve's like, well, we'll, we're not afraid to raise rates. I mean, it's all completely distorted. Why is it so distorted? And is the stock market supposed to just keep going up? And how does that keep going up? Well, they're doing a great job, and their indicators and their alarm bells are just not sounding. The, it was the Office of, the, of Financial Research, the U.S. Treasury's Financial Crisis Warning Bell, which is called the Financial Stress Index, and this was coming from the Wall Street on Parade this week, that the, this mechanism, this index, failed to, per, failed to indicate to us that there were two, actually two major financial crises after the 08 crisis. That was the repo market issue, and that was the, the bank runs that we saw and the three big bank failures in the states that we saw earlier this spring. The indicator didn't provide us with the alarm bells. And what, what Wall Street on Parade alludes to is they're saying, you know, these mechanisms are used to delude the American people and delude us people into thinking that these central banks and the regulators knows what's going on inside the U.S. banking system. When recent history has shown time and time again, they clearly do not know what's going on. And so they're using these indicators. They're using these tools, these very sophisticated sounding tools to really delude us and to suggest that they're in control, but we can look at the numbers. The numbers do not lie. They're not in control. They're entirely trapped. The system is showing the cracks and the cracks are abounding. And, you know, we're going to get into a big example of how these distortions play out after the break. But in the meantime, 
You can get involved in the precious metal market by just giving us a call at one eight seven seven eight silver You can get it physically. You call us. You can go to the e-store. You buy it direct. You take home delivery. If you can't hold it, you don't own it. Now, once you kind of move beyond a cash holding, you might want to think about storage, insurance, liquidity, being able to sell on a phone call, go on vacation, you're busy, you're working, you want to pick up the phone and sell when, when the time comes. Or you need it, you know, you, you're, you're away and you say, listen, I need access to liquidity, these type of things. The, the depository is a great way to go. Fully allocated, fully segregated. You can go to the vault, personally audit. That means it passes the litmus test. If you can't hold it, you don't own it. Well, you can go there and personally hold your product in your hand, take delivery anytime you want. The last way to do it, especially for those that are maybe feeling the pinch but want to get involved in the market, there's the registered accounts. We hear every day people are not doing so great in the registered accounts. Meanwhile, their manager, their, the management expense ratios are over 2.5%. You can get involved in physical precious metals in a registered account. All you have to do is give us a call. We'll show you how to do it. You're going to end up with directly owned physical precious metals held within your registered account but stored outside the banking system. That's right. It's your own physical product, no counterparty risk, no third party. You're going to go to the vault, personally audit your holdings, which means guess what? Passes that litmus test. If you can't hold it, you don't own it. In this case, you go to the vault personally hold your product in your hand and if you're at the time where you can you're at a riff and you're taking funds out you could take delivery of it now if you want to know if you could take delivery of uh, your product from an RSP you can there's going to be withholding taxes but if you're in a type of asset that's going to outperform inflation then maybe you don't care about the 30 percent you know if you were up a thousand percent you probably wouldn't care and silver went up over 1,100% in the 70s. We feel we're going to see those numbers again. So this is a great way to get your retirement house in order and think about having some physical metal in that portfolio. I've said enough. The number, one eight seven seven eight silver The website, guildhallwealth.com. More to come. And when we're talking about more to come, we're talking about a crack-up boom in the stock market and what that means to your money coming up in The Real Money Show on 640 Toronto. Welcome back to The Real Money Show, the number one eight seven seven eight silver the website, guildhallwealth.com. We're recording today on a Friday, December 1st. Happy to report that gold has reached an all-time high. We have held and closed out the month of November above $2,000 an ounce. I believe on the year, gold is well up over 10% in Canadian dollars. Silver's been making a move recently. We're now up about 5 5 6% on the year in Canadian dollars. And the reason I mention it in Canadian dollars is because we're a Canadian show and we're hedging the Canadian dollar. Which actually, before we get into uh, the Venezuelan stock market and distortions in reports, Jerry, I want to just quickly talk about the exchange because people are often concerned that, well, if I buy gold and silver in U.S. dollars, I'm going to lose 35%. But that's not really the case, is it? Not at all. It's just the price that you're paying in your currency. In all currencies, if you, value, if you look at all the currencies, major currencies, all priced in gold and silver, you'll notice one clear trend, is, and, is, and that is every single major currency is falling approximately 8% versus gold and or silver. So it's not a matter of which currency you should be looking at. Of course it is if you're in a place like Japan, for example. This is a place where you want to definitely jump into gold or silver. Places like Turkey over the last couple of years, countries that are witnessing inflation and potential stag stagflation and hyperinflation situations, it is now time to look outside of falling, failing fiat currencies. And just for the Canadian listeners, the loonie has lost over 96% of its value since 1915, and our central bank, the Bank of Canada, is spouting the same 
jargon as the U.S. Federal Reserve. They really don't know what they're doing. So as a result, the Canadian population should be acquiring precious metals um, like never before. The number one eight seven seven eight silver the website, guildhallwealth.com. Yeah, when it comes to the exchange rate, I often say, look, we have to buy it in U.S. dollars. It's the re world's reserve currency. What you're actually losing in that exchange is not 1.35 or 1.39, but actually the cost on the exchange. And if you're doing that cost in the right place, you can save a lot of money, right? If you're exchanging at a bank, you're going to lose maybe upwards of five, 600 basis points. If you're traveling and you're putting, you know, you're in the States and you buy something on your credit card, you could be paying nine, 900 basis points for that exchange. Or if you're changing up money at the airport, it's a really high exchange. When we're using the exchange with registered accounts, um, who we work with Questrade, they're the custodian, we have very low rates. And we continue those low rates and match them at Guildhall as well. So of one of the advantages of buying precious metals is that you're not paying high exchange rates. Uh, so ultimately, that's we try to get rid of that as an issue. And one other thing about the exchange rate versus gold and silver prices is when the gold and silver prices do take off and start the bull run cycle that we're anticipating, and actually we're beginning uh, to see the run up, the gains in metals will outperform the gains in your loonie. So if the loonie heads from 135, 1.35, where we're at today, down to par, yep. that would be 35%. So the gains in metals far outweigh any gains in the loonie, so you're not off, being offset by your gains in the loonie. So you still want to position, you still want to position while the cost for gold and silver are priced really low and competitively right now in gold and in US dollars. So just wanted to add that. No, that's true. You know, in, in about, I think around 2005, 2006, the exchange rate was way over 140. And it was a big deal for a lot of people back then. And do you know when it came to par, when it went to par? 2011. That's right. When silver was trading at $48 an ounce. So you're sitting there saying, so, you know, it's not a premium. Again, it's just the cost of the exchange itself. You're not paying 40% more because what you're, what you're getting in the end is an international, is international money, right? It, you're valuing things in ounces and, uh, let, you know, valuing the stock market in ounces, for example, this is called a segue, Jerry. <laughs> I feel it. I feel um, it coming on. In 1980, the Dow traded at 850 points and gold traded at $850. That's a one-to-one -one ratio. Today, that ratio is roughly 17, 18 to one. In 2011, we got down to four to one when the Dow Jones came off its lows, was trading around 8,000 points, and gold hit 2,000. So we were at a four to one ratio. Right now, again, we're at 17 to 18. During the dot com, we were as high as over 40 to one. So that ratio could get uh, pretty crazy. But what would it look like if the stock market continued higher and higher and higher? What could the ratio look like? What could gold look like? Um, you know, with with regards to the valuation of the stock market, um, you know, you're looking at a lot of gauges, you're looking at standard deviation, um, and I'll talk about that momentarily, as something was reported through Zero Hedge and Jamie Carrasco from Canaccord Genuity commented on. Everything everything looks overvalued right now in the stock market. So to, so to think that it can continue to go up, it's a very dangerous, in my opinion, a very dangerous roll of the dice. So when we think about finding undervalued assets, Silver, in our opinion, in my humble opinion, is the most undervalued asset on the planet, hands down. You cannot find an asset that is worth so much for so little. And another way to put that is it's an asymmetric trade. If the all-in cost to, to get silver out of the ground is just under $20 and it's trading at just over $25, what is the downside risk? Four bucks, five bucks, four or five dollars. Like if you can't handle, if you can't handle that ride, and what happens if it goes to that cost of production or lower? What would happen to the premium? Guess what? You're not going to be buying it for twenty five dollars an ounce, right? Or you, sorry, you're not going to be buying it for twenty dollars an ounce. They're going to raise the premiums, and you're still going to be paying twenty four dollars an ounce. So asymmetry is something we want to find. We want to find low risk entry points with high upside potential, which we're going to get into, but just wanted to make that That is that a note. great point. I'm happy. I love that you mentioned that because yeah, you do want to keep an eye on where the, val where the cost 
to mine silver and gold are today, and on average about $19 to $20. You have a very low downside risk versus tremendous topside potential. And topside potential is what many people in the market think that stock market continue to run. Why is gold going up and the stock market going up at the same time? So we're just going to transition over to the stock market for a little bit and talk about a stock market melt-up that we saw because of the currency devaluation. So a stock market melt-up is essentially a reverse stock market crash. This happens when leaders print currency aggressively rather than fix the underlying issue. Now, this is a chart, and we shared this, we just tweeted this, we put this on Instagram. It's a chart of one of the most successful stock market bull runs in history, Venezuela, which had its stock market pump a whopping 200,000% in a very short period of time several years ago. This was, of course, simply due to their currency being devalued. What are you valuing wealth in? The stock market, on the other hand, at the same time, also measures its dollars, uh, measures its stock market in dollars, fiat currency, and much of the incredible rise of the share market in the U.S. stock market from 2020 and beyond was nothing but a devaluation in the currency that the shares are measured in. So our message today is loud and clear. Value your wealth in ounces, not worthless paper fiat currencies. So what are we valuing our assets on? What is the Bitcoin valued on? The U.S. dollars that are worthless. We don't know how worthless it is because the ga gauges are broken, Jeremy. Well, Everything yeah. is just actually skewed. Well, yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's obviously going to be money to be made on future technologies and things like that. But when you start to say, well, what is something really worth? Um, you know, what can you buy for fifty thousand dollars, and what does something do for you for fifty thousand dollars? Is is kind of the question. You know, uh, is it a pets dot com? I I don't know. I would say you know, it, it's one thing. It's not. Is it's not a store of value. We don't. You cannot say that that's the truth yet, because with gold and silver, it's been money, which is the the principle being a store of value for thousands of years. Um, where do you want to go to next, Jerry? Do you want to do you want to talk about do you want to talk about industrial demand, which is huge, um, and the and the supply side of it, and the usages for it? Do you want to talk about Exter's pyramid? I do, do want to go that that route. I just feel it in my gut to talk about that, and then we can go over to the uh, to the industrial side of things. Okay, so uh, stick with us. We're we're doing with a lot. We're dealing with a lot of stuff here. The number one eight seven seven eight silver. The website guildhallwealth.com. The main takeaway is gold and silver are money. They're on the table of elements. They do not. They do not erode. They do not corrode. They will not disappear. They've been valued for thousands of years. Look at the monetary methadone, as as Gerald Salente says. Look at the experiment that we are in the midst of. You want to get out of harm's way. Get some physical precious metals in your portfolio. And to do that, you just give us a call. Let's talk about Exter's Pyramid, Jerry, and the third wave. Yes, let's get to the Exter's Pyramid. So Octavio Costa, we, we often quote him. He's... He uh, came out tweeting from Crescat Capital uh, today earlier. He, he tweeted saying, undeniably a pivotal moment in the precious metals industry. A monthly close at an all-time high would likely mark the beginning of another secular bull move in gold and in silver, in our opinion. This is yet to be propelled, propelled by two primary drivers, buyers. Number one, central banks, which even with their recent purchases still own 80% of sovereign debt relative to their balance sheet assets. And number two, traditional 60-40 portfolios, currently with 0% allocation to gold, are yet to redefine their mandates to incorporate, to include precious metals as another defensive alternative. This is an opportune moment to actively seek ways to express this view in the market. And if you look at this, he posts an amazing chart on the history of gold cycles. We clearly have uh, two two um, major super cycles in, in precious metal, in gold from 1970 up to 1980. That was a stagflationary effect. That was where that that's where we saw the performance of gold hit about 800 percent. Then from 2000 to 2011, and then now we're at the beginning of another gold super cycle. And he cites so many reasons as to why we're going to be seeing this cycle. Well, let's get to those reasons. We'll talk about the first two legs, 
and what those reasons were, and then what the re all of the reasons for the next leg moving higher. We'll talk about that in the next break, what Exter's Pyramid is and how that works. Before you do, give us a call, 1-8-778-SILVER, website, guildhallwealth.com. Physical precious metals in a registered account. Think about it. Your retirement. Hold something for the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years. That's going to keep your purchasing power alive, increase your purchasing power, and make your retirement worthwhile. The number, again, one eight seven seven eight silver The website, guildhallwealth.com. More to come. Real Money Show, 640 Toronto. Welcome back to The Real Money Show. The number one eight seven seven eight silver and the website, guildhallwealth.com. Learn about holding physical precious metals in a registered account. Learn about holding physical precious metals, and we'll show you how to do it. Jerry, before break, we were talking about that gold has been around for thousands of years, and our colleague heard that and looked it up and said, just told us during break, that gold is mentioned 417 times in the Bible. <laughs> that is amazing. Um, and it's true. Um, and what we're gonna, about to see is going to be a biblical move in the gold and the silver market. Because back to this Octavio Costa chart, the chart is just so clear. It's a 30 year chart. I mean, you can't go back any further to see such a clear trend. So you had the first cycle where we had about four reasons as to why the gold market broke up. Decent, which you know, were falling gold production, inflationary regime, a lack of new gold discoveries. And then from 2000, we had falling with three, three reasons. Falling gold production, gold to S&P 500 ratio at historical lows, and China driving commodities demand. Actually, I, I remember that. I remember we wrote reports back in 2003, four saying, you know, the, 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 the giant of China is going to demand so much physical gold and silver, it's going to drive prices. That was a big, a big driver at the time. So that was part of that, that leg. And then we had quantitative easing during that part as right. well, which really kind of pushed it beyond. Uh, talk to us about this third leg coming up. And the third leg right now. So the 2011 peak was, what was it, um, in 2000? It was in 2011, 2011. actually. 2011. <laughs> and then here we have 12 reasons going forward into the next super cycle from falling gold demand, uh, global rising deglobalization trends, do global de-dollarizing trends, G7 economies entering, re revitalizing era. You just you just name it. There's 12 reasons. Keep going. Um, trifecta of macro imbalances. There's a debt problem of the 40s, inflationary issues of the 70s, asset valuation imbalances in the two, 1920s and 1990s, central banks accumulating gold, government debt at historic levels, unsustainability, unsustainably high fiscal deficits, and including the other the other reasons that we saw in the past. So we add all this together, and this move points to, according to Crestcat Capital, north of $10,000 US per ounce. And where that puts the silver, if we do go back to a 30, uh, maybe a 25 to one ratio, silver to gold ratio, that puts silver at around $400 per ounce. So this is a biblical move that we're about to see, and the move that is going to cause, what's causing um, this move would be participation, in which alludes to the Exter's Pyramid. Because as he mentioned earlier, the traditional portfolio owns no gold. Okay, that's what we talked about. You know, less than 1% of the Canadian population own gold. Less than 1% less than of the U.S. population own gold. So we bring in the extra pyramid. If all of the global financial assets, which equates to about $200 trillion, if just 1.5% of all that money sloshing around jumps into the finite gold market. How much? 1.5%. Okay. Eliminates all investable gold. However, just 0.5% of all that money will eliminate all the physical silver in the world. And that is where we see the crack up boom, not anywhere else. It's going to be in precious metals. The, the skyrocketing that we're going to see in sil silver, that coiled spring, is going to be unlike anything that we have ever witnessed. So just, to, just for, for those who aren't familiar with Exter's pyramid, Exter was a central banker who, who explained central banking via a, an inverted pyramid. And the inverted pyramid's peak at the very bottom is gold, and the tip is silver, and everything above it becomes 
sort of more and more and more derivative debt. So you start with cash above it, and then from there you move into mortgages, and then from there it just kind of gets bigger and bigger into derivatives and debt. So it's uh, an inverted pyramid, and what it's demonstrating is what what JP Morgan said, which is gold and silver are money, and everything else is credit. And if you can understand that, if you can understand that what you have in front of you, central banker, is a printing press, and understand what the reality is, it's kind of like Inception, Jerry. They had that uh, token thing, I forget what it was called, where they, to understand what reality was, Yes, remember? Yep. I forget what they called it. Was it, a, it was a token or something. And you know, if, if it, whatever it did would tell you if you were in the dream or in the reality. <laughs> so Exeter's yes, Pyramid that. is basically describing to central bankers what the dream is and what reality is. And gold and silver are the reality. And at some point, the, the, the whole pyramid is going to break down. And where that money goes is it's going to go down and further and further down. And uh, now, so... You have uh, Octavia Costa talking about the third leg up in gold, and that, as you as you rightly pointed out, it's going to be biblical. Now, at the same time, when we talk about silver, you mentioned uh, half a percent of all the markets moving into silver. Let's talk about some of the current demand in the silver market, which is going to drive it regardless of if people decide to get into the market. So we're talking about solar power and we're talking about the military, but let's talk about solar power. Bix Weir does a great um, video series on his YouTube channel, Road to Ruta. Love, love the song um, he, <laughs> that he has as the intro, yeah. um, Pay Me My Silver Now. Uh, he's talking about the demand on silver from China, and it's ridiculous. Can you tell us just a quick bit before we go to break? Just absolutely ridiculous. The numbers just speak for themselves. Um, and he was quoted as saying, why is no one talking about the, the 2023 solar silver numbers? It's easy math for this everywhere. And it's a, definitely a red alert silver squeeze for solar installations. For 2023, solar installations was 413 gigawatts, which equals 283 million ounces of silver. So that's whopping. That demand in one industry. It's of, like half the, half the year supply. Yeah. And they're saying in a couple of years or a decade from now, it's going to demand even more, potentially 90 plus percent of all. So this is what we're seeing. Um, this is, you know, it's an element that has myriad of critical industry use usages. <clears throat> and once it's used, it's rarely recycled. It's basically gone. Unlike gold that lasts forever, this tiny silver market, you know, 0.5% of all that money, it's a very tiny market, has the potential to be gold on steroids and rapidly move upwards and towards, you know, triple digit, some even cite, you know, quadruple digit silver. I can see that happening. But again, we're focusing on this industry of solar, where we don't, there's an elephant in the room. And we talk about this all the time, silver squeeze for peace. The military demand is approximately 15 times more than that key driver combined. So we got to keep draining the mints. We have to keep you know, every single ounce that you take out. And you're putting pressure on the profits, the profits of the military industrial complex. And if we really want world peace, every single ounce counts. Because every missile, there's 500, a monster box, 500 ounces of silver in one little missile. And, you know, this is where the markets, this is where the elements are going. It's going into these these um, heavyweight industries, Jeremy. So it's a very exciting time to get into the silver market. And where we're headed, it's going through the roof. Look, these are these are uh, times that are struggle. They're, they are kind of the worst of times. And if you can find opportunity during those times, you are going to have astounding success. And what we're putting in front of you, from what we believe, we're not your advisors, go seek the, the ones of those you trust. But when you look at the story of this and the timing of it right now, this could be generational wealth just like it was in 1979, 1980. So look for those opportunities because now is the time. The number, one eight seven seven eight silver the website, guildhallwealth.com. More to come on The Real Money Show, 640 Toronto.
Welcome back to The Real Money Show, the number, one eight seven seven eight silver the website, guildhallwealth.com. We're going to monitor closely throughout uh, this last segment because it's around 2 p.m. and... Uh, um, Powell has decided to speak again today. Twice. So, so we'll see. We'll see what that's all about. Look, these are are uh, tough times, and in tough times, can often present the best opportunities if you've got your eyes open. So we've been talking about uh, the precious metal sector, specifically silver, and what a good deal it is. We've talked a little bit about the huge demand for solar power. We've talked about the huge demand from the military. That's not talking about all of the new usages for it or the current usages for it in things like, you know, computers, cars, cell phones, plasma screen TVs, anything digital, anything electronic has silver in it. And it's part of our everyday lives. And it's so integral and important to our everyday lives. And yet, this is what we're seeing in the market that, you know, there's 2 billion ounces of silver. It's at $25 an ounce. It's a $50 billion market. And if a small amount of people move into this market, it's just going to be gone, which is something we've talked about, that at one point it would become unattainment. unattainment. Did I say that right? Sorry. can't say it right. <laughs> anyway, um, just to review, we talked about the crack-up boom in stocks, that that would be an indicator of hyperinflation in the currency, that the, cur the stocks are going up, but your currency is worthless. And when you look at today's stock market and there many things are overvalued, yes, there's always going to be winners and losers. Yes, there's value to be found, right? That asymmetry we talked about, which we're seeing in silver, that you can mine it for less than tw just under $20 an ounce. So what's the downside, right, versus the upside in having real money in your portfolio? Uh, what else did we talk about today, Jared, just to give a quick review? Well, we talked about... Um the 60-40 split, the, you know, the extras pyramid opportunity and demand um, that we're seeing and the performance of precious metals so far in the month, you know, gold closing now at two, over $2,000. That's a huge signal. And if we can close out the week at all-time highs, I mean, we're sitting at all-time highs right now. But to think that you missed a boat, absolutely not. The road ahead is going to be one that is going to be epic. It's going to be a money maker. It's, it's a huge uh, door. It's a door that's open. You want to walk through this opportunity, give us a call and find out how to include gold in your portfolio. The 60-40 portfolio, what I talked about, is primarily just a stock bond portfolio, 60% stock, 40% bond. But when those two markets start moving in the same direction, you're not diversified. So diversification is found in inversely correlated assets, assets that are going to move in the opposite direction. And when we're headed into this type of environment, which is a stagflationary environment, I just challenge you, I want to encourage you to Google search stagflation, and you'll see how many articles, how many news agencies are actually talking about this, which is a unique combination of stagnation, lack of growth, and high inflation. Just this morning, the U.S. Manufacturing Survey signaled further stagflation. They saw final print for the S&P Global U.S. Manufacturing PMI drop into contraction to 49.4, driven by a decline in new orders and employment. This is not very good news for the stock market for global growth. In fact, when we look at growth in equities, the U.S. right now is near extreme peaks, the U.S. stock market near extreme peaks versus global equities. So when you're looking at your 60-40 portfolio split, you got to think twice. This is the time to look at what uh, you know gold and silver does. And we got reminded today from Jamie Carrasco out of Canaccord Genuity in Toronto. He wrote, gold and silver were the best performers through stagfl the stagflation period that was needed to cleanse that credit bubble that followed the Nifty 50 period. And the Nifty 50, where that was 50 stocks, you know, the Disney and the Coca-Cola and the McDonald's shares of the 60s. Um, during the 60s, there was a great run-up. You know, it hit, uh, hit a standard deviation peak at about 1.6. Today's U.S. stock market is double that extreme. And the standard deviation means the higher, the more risks as they're above the mean or their average. You know, that what you're talking about here, that everything is already well above the mean, it sounds very similar to what you described earlier with the Venezuela stock market, that you reach a point where it's not 
really about the gains. It's more about the lack of value in the dollar. And it seems that what we're seeing in the stock market right now is sort of that cusping of that area where you've already reached a point where many things, not all things, I know we're we're doing a we're casting with a broad brush here, but in general, there's so many stocks that are overvalued that you're you're moving into that region of a crack up boom, and so how do you avoid the challenges with that and the and the dangers of that is to get out of harm's way and store some of your wealth, protect some of it. It's we're not saying all of it, but have that insurance policy on your wealth. If you have home insurance and car insurance and life insurance, how are you insuring your wealth? You know, they're they're taking thirty five, forty percent of your income. They're taking another thirteen percent on everything you buy after that. Then they put inflation. They say, Oh, so it's at three percent, six percent. No, it's at fifteen percent. We're close to seventy percent of the value of our hard labor being thrown out the window to what? What are they doing with it? <laughs> they want to tax you more, right? With ideologies. So how do you protect against that and change that into an opportunity? And that's hopefully that's what the audience has taken away today is just the spectacular opportunity right now as silver's trading just over $25 an ounce and gold at $2,000 an ounce and all new high. Who cares? Who cares all time high? It's going to be at an all time high every day now, every month now for the next five, six, seven years. And, and the mainstream media will probably tell us, Oh, it's at all time highs, like dangerous. No, not when the money is worthless. On that, I mean, there is an amazing quote that just caught my attention. And the quote was from Robert Ringer, who was an entrepreneur in the U.S. He said, if there ever was an area in which to do the exact opposite of, of that which government and the media and even financial managers urge you to do, that area is the purchasing and holding of gold. So despite what they're saying, you got to do the exact opposite. Be counterintuitive. The time is now. Run counter be that uh, that fish going upstream. You'll help everyone else when you've done very, very well. And uh, thank you so much to everyone for listening. We're very excited about the market. Give us a call, one eight seven seven eight silver the website, guildhallwealth.com. Jerry, thanks for joining. Again, thanks to everyone for listening. And if you've missed an episode, last week was really good. Check us out on YouTube. Check out our Twitter. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you next week here on The Real Money Show on 640 Toronto.